Our final speaker today is Dr. Weiwei Li. And forgive me, Weiwei, I'm, I'm going to be very brief in my introduction. Doc, Dr. Li is a Buxbaum Institute junior faculty scholar, is the Associate Dean of Students and Professional Development at the Pritzker School of Medicine, and an Associate Professor of Medicine. She earned her medical degree from NYU School of Medicine and her Master's of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health completed her residency in internal medicine at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, Weill Cornell. At Pritzker School of Medicine, Weiwei directs the Wellness Initiative, and her research focuses on trainee and faculty well-being and the impact of technology use on the doctor-patient relationship. Her title today will be Helping Doctors in Distress, Addressing Burnout to Enhance patient-doctor relationships. Weiwei, it's a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siegler, for that introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and get my presentation up. Wonderful. So um, I'm excited to talk today about um, how we can address physician burnout and the impact that that can have on enhancing our patient-doctor relationships. So as an overview, burnout is, um, has been formally defined um, as a state of vital exhaustion, right? So it is a syndrome that is um, resulting from chronic workplace stress that's not been successfully managed. So the important part there is that it is um, you know, a, a, a syndrome that's really driven by workplace-related um, situations. And we know that there have been many studies on physician burnout over the years. Um, this is a study that has taken a look at large surveys of physician data um, across the past um, six or seven years. The last large survey was published in 2017. And at that point, um, the amongst physicians sur surveyed across multiple disciplines, the mean burnout rate was 44%, which is two times that of other US workers. And the systemic drivers of burnout um, have been found to be related to high workloads, um, workflow inefficiencies, lack of support services, um, issues related to alignment of leadership and, and other values, and the loss of autonomy and control and meaning at work. So this is an image from um, that last study I just mentioned. And you can see that across the different specialties in medicine, the burnout varies greatly, right? And so the mean burnout is um, around 44%, but you can scan up and down this chart and see that um, the um, burnout rates really do vary depending on um, particular specialties and then even within institutions, depending on practice settings. And big picture wise, we can also, um, uh, we're getting a better understanding of the picture of how burnout progresses um, in a medical uh, career and throughout training. So it's been found that when students enter medical school, they actually have better mental health um, compared to their age matched peers. So they have lower burnout scores, um, lower depression, higher quality of life scores on standardized measures. Unfortunately, we see that these measures are reversed by the second year of medical school and that burnout actually increases in residency. Um, and it, you know, unfortunately, we also see that burnout um, does peak in mid-career um, for um, faculty physicians about 10 to 20 years into practice. So clearly this is a, you know, a major problem for our profession and for our training. And why do we care? You know, why is it important that we think about burnout? Um, well, in addition to being a threat to our, you know, clinical, financial, and reputational success as um, an institution and as a, you know, as a profession, um, you know, there are sort of uh, specific costs related to um, business costs, right? So turnover and reduction of work effort. Um, physicians who are burnout are, you know, more than 200 times uh, more likely to leave practice or reduce their professional effort or time in seeing patients. And the replacement cost is significant, it's estimated to cost between $500,000 to a billion dollars to replace a physician who leaves the workforce. And you know, studies are mounting and show that burnout can be prevented with organizational initiatives that address those systemic drivers. So why do we care? You know, um, big picture wise, you know, for our physicians, um, there are significant personal consequences right? So in their own personal lives and their relationships um, in alcohol and substance use and rates of depression and other mental health concerns and, and in suicides. 
Um, but it has a large impact on our patients as well. There are many studies that show that physicians who are burnt out are more likely to um, engage in unprofessional behaviors, more medical errors, and decreased um, patient satisfaction and um, relationship. And so, you know, there are multiple reasons why we really need to think about addressing this from a more systematic um, approach. And let's not forget the, you know, incredible stressor that has um, that has been upon us for um, the past two years or so now, the COVID pandemic. This has really amplified a lot of this distress that physicians are experiencing. And this study by the Physicians Foundation, um, you know, during the pandemic, found that amongst those physicians they surveyed, 58% um, were having feelings of burnout compared to 40% in their prior studies. And nearly one in four physicians reported knowing a physician who died by suicide. And that's not to mention the impact on um, increased use of medication, alcohol, or illicit drugs that were also solicited from that um, survey. And I do really want to emphasize that resilience deficit is not the problem. Our physicians and our trainees are incredibly resilient, right? Um, studies have shown that physicians have higher personal resilience than workers in other fields. And, um, you know, as recent studies also found that close to 30% of physicians who have the highest possible resilience scores were burnt out. So these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, and resilience is, is certainly not um, something that our, our physician workforce lacks. So what about mental health distress? Well, there have been um, lots of studies on um, depression and other mental health distress amongst medical students. And this is a recent systematic review of meta-analysis that took a look at over um, 190 studies. And they found that the overall prevalence of depression among medical students was 27% with a very wide range between nine and 56% um, within those studies. And that if you compare that to their age match controls, um, it's significantly higher. Um, the age match controls are, are typically more in the range of seven to 9%. Um, and alarmingly, among medical students who experience depression, only 16% sought treatment. And so there's a major issue that we need to address in the stigma, access to care, and mental health support that we're providing our trainees and the future physicians um, that we are bringing into the workforce. Equally alarming is thinking about the suicidal ideation rates that exist. And in this meta-analysis, it was found that suicidal ideation was around 11% for medical students in these studies. There's a similar study that has taken a look at depression um, amongst resident physicians. And this again was another um, uh, review of meta-analysis. And again, the depression prevalence is pretty similar at close to 30%. Um, and that within the, um, within the, the time frame of starting training of entering year, that there was a 16% increase in um, depression symptoms. Um, they found that there was no difference between non-surgical versus surgical resident trainees, and that there were similar rates across specialties, um, postgraduate years, and then country of practice. So they looked at international studies as well. So this is the data that we have that exists on students and residents, but it's also important to know that very little data actually exists on rates of depression in faculty and practicing physicians. But from what we know about the data related to burnout and in thinking about the trajectory of students and residents, um, you know, I think it's, um, it's, it's likely that that uh, rate of depression amongst practicing faculty and physicians also remains quite high. And I do also want to make sure we talk about physician suicide. Um, so it's been estimated that three to 400 physicians die um, by year um, by suicide. And again, you know, that suicidal ideation data is really important to think about, um, and, you know, as sort of points of intervention and ways that we can think about um, saving lives, right, of our physician colleagues. Um, interns within their first three months, um, studies have found that suicidal ideation increases by 370%. Um, amongst residents, the 12 month rate of um, suicidal ideation is around 8%. And studies of practicing surgeons have found lifetime prevalence of around 15%. So, you know, as you know, again, we move forward from the COVID pandemic, um, it's going to be incredibly important to focus on the mental health of our physicians, in addition to, to burnout. And these are, you know, different concepts and, and, um, and have different drivers in, in, uh, in many ways. So how do we think about helping physicians in distress? 
So, you know, oftentimes the idea of faculty engagement is thought about as the opposite of burnout and the opposite of distress, right? This is defined as a connection to one's work, characterized by dedication and absorption and rigor. And um, engaged physicians have overall higher career satisfaction and are more likely to stay in their current role regardless of their level of burnout. So it is really, you know, in our profession's interest and in an organization's interest to really promote faculty engagement um, for the physicians as well as the patients that they serve. You know, Stanford has really um, led the way in thinking about um, physician engagement and professional fulfillment. And they have a model that I think really encapsulates um, a nice way to think about how we can impact um, physician distress in a meaningful way. And so you see that there is, um, there are three parts that uh, can be drivers of um, professional fulfillment, right? The culture of wellness at an institution, the leadership and whether or not they value this culture of well-being, the values of an institution, finding meaning at work, collegiality, peer support, all of those factors um, are incredibly important in thinking about um, the culture of well-being. And then, um, you know, it's not to, you know, we need to really think about efficiency of practice as well, really thinking about how our, um, our healthcare system, our clinical and you know, hospital workflows, um, how that impacts the physician's ability to provide the highest level of care and highest quality of care for our patients. So that has to do with EHR usability, and efficient workflows, scheduling, um, patient portal, um, you know, the team-based care, turnaround times in the OR and staffing, right? And so you'll note that those two pieces are actually two thirds of this pie. And that personal resilience, right, is also important, but it, it is indeed a smaller part of um, what drives professional fulfillment. So personal resilience and helping physicians think about um, self-compassion, about being able to engage in self-care, um, finding ways to enhance the work-life integration and social support, and developing um, emotional flexibility and cognitive skills to manage with um, stress and, and the stressors of our profession. So there are um, more and more studies coming out about how we can address these systemic drivers of burnout. And there are lots of domains to really think about within that context about how we can think about workload and job demands, um, really think about uh, giving physicians more control and flexibility over their work, looking at those culture and values, um, community collegiality, collegiality, and interventions have been studied and, and taken a look at in the literature. You know, and the good news is that the, um, that Systematic reviews and meta-analyses on these interventions have found that burnout can be decreased with these different types of interventions. So this is a systematic review taking a look at 52 studies and that both individually focused interventions, so those around personal resilience and the self-compassion and meditation and those types of interventions, in addition to those structural and organizational strategies, you know, looking at workloads, practice efficiency, work-life integration, both of these can actually result in clinically meaningfully reductions in burnout among physicians, right? If you take a look at this other study, this is just pulling out the controlled interventions that looked at burnout in physicians. And again, this is another systematic review and meta-analysis. So this one is taking a look at 20 studies and they found a small but significant reduction in burnout when you look at these controlled interventions. Um, and that when you compare physician directed um, and organizationally directed interventions, the organizationally directed ones were um, found to be more effective. So um, what is our local environment here at University of Chicago? So we have, um, as an institution, I think made many efforts across um, the past you know, several years to address physician well-being and engagement. And I think that many of these efforts have been housed in, um, in uh, you know, specific committees and in thinking about um, ways that um, our organization through different departmental initiatives um, and other committees can address these um, issues and burnout and physician engagement in a meaningful way. Now, unfortunately, despite these efforts, um, we, it's been found that um, our burnout um, scores and the rate of burnout at our institution is quite high, at close to 80% um, in 2019, and that only 32% of faculty were reporting feeling engaged or fulfilled. And so this really led to um, Dean Polanski and um, the president of our hospital, Tom Jackowitz, to convene um, a faculty engagement task force to really think about how we can make recommendations as, as an institution to 
better address faculty engagement. And I had the um, privilege of helping to lead this task force with, um, with Allison Tothi and, um, and Jay Pinto as well. So I'll talk a little bit about the recommendations that came from that task force, um, which comprised of representatives from each of our departments um, who were um, experts and um, interested in thinking about physician engagement and provided these recommendations to our hospital leadership. So the recommendations that came from this task force related to developing um, an organizational structure that was committed to lead efforts on faculty engagement um, that uh, was senior leadership um, um, level type of role and organizational structure, um, really to have sustained and dedicated resources and accountability for faculty engagement. Um, really also needing to address the culture of well being at our institution, um, and then importantly to enhance clinical efficiency. Um, we also recommended being able to implement strategies to mitigate burnout and to improve the mental health of our physicians and to generate ideas for sustainability and continuous quality improvement. And of course, these are recommendations that were primarily focused on physicians here at um, University of Chicago. And um, you know, the, the work around well-being and burnout and engagement really needs to um, bridge and you know, think about how um, engagement of our staff and our you know, trainees and our um, res and our students also really um, you know, can work together to improve um, the well-being of our um, physicians and you know, our future workforce as well. So next steps, um, I think many of you might have seen that um, Dean Polanski and President Jackowitz recently put out a call um, to search for a chief wellness and vitality officer for physicians here at our institution, whose really main concern is going to be to improve the work environment for our physicians, um, taking a look at the workloads, the practice efficient, efficiency issues, organizational values, um, EHR, clinical burden, all of those organizational factors, and to really also think about enhancing the collegiality and mental health support. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, with these efforts and with the data that is available in the national literature around addressing burnout and physician engagement, um, I think there are real opportunities to improve patient care and to improve patient-doctor relationship and to improve the well-being of our physicians. So with that, I will pause there. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee, for your um, expert guidance and help with this very important area. I can tell you when I started in medicine, nobody talked about burnout. So the fact that we're even talking about it and addressing it is a huge step, uh, step forward. Um, I was actually struck by that one slide you showed of the different specialties that have burnout. And it's not surprising to me that the emergency department was top on that list. If you go down to our emergency department any day of the week, you'll see how crazy and hectic that uh, place is in the hospital, especially with COVID, um, I think making it even more and trauma, making it even more of a difficult place many times to work. Are there any um, thoughts or any ways that we can um, focus on areas where we know that burnout may be even more of a problem and um, try to come up with um, mitigations, uh, you know, not just overall the whole institution, but focus on areas where we know that uh, a problem can really be um, a major um, source of burnout. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Frontino. That's, um, that's exactly right. The strategy really has to be targeted to the needs of that particular department or section even, because the drivers of the stress are gonna be quite varied even within the same institution. So what, um, you know, what are the main um, drivers of burnout in emergency department are gonna be quite different than for our surgeons or for our general medicine practitioners. And so institutions that have really implemented um, large organizational interventions around um, burnout and well-being have really partnered with um, uh, leaders and champions from each of those specific departments to um, do uh, some very targeted listening and, and, and understanding um, the specific challenges and then developing interventions that are quite specific for that practice and work environment. So that really is the optimal approach. Um, and to really be taking a look at the data closely and understand <coughs> Um, from these surveys, which of our departments or um, providers might be experiencing the highest burnout and prioritizing um, resources and efforts there. So there's lots of ways to address that. One of the questions on the Q&A is how should employers balance their responsibility towards their staff while also ensuring continuity of the operation, especially if a lot of their staff are starting to experience uh, burnout and experience problems? 
Yeah, that is a really, um, I think, important question. And I really think that, you know, when you think about staff um, and sort of, you know, the, the people and the um, connections that need to be formed to provide, um, you know, care for our patients in, in a patient-centered way and um, in a clinically optimal way, um, I think just addressing physician burnout is really not going to be enough and really thinking about how we can align our resources and align the leadership, you know, across um, our nursing and other staff and, um, you know, GME and UME to really address this um, at that higher level and integrate those efforts. Um, and I do think that there is a business case for addressing this. I think that if we're able to invest in our physician workforce and to ensure that the um, well-being of our providers and our staff and our caretakers are addressed that really will translate to better care um, and better patient doctor um, interactions. And then finally, if um, I'm on the wards and I notice that a resident uh, seems to be um, having some problems or a student's having some problems or one of my colleagues, um, uh, what can I do? How can I reach out? Are there resources that I can um, uh, uh, help to support uh, somebody that I think is starting to have problems with burnout? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and that is something that I think um, needs to probably be communicated better and to have a, a better process for that. I know that Dr. Blanchard's office, um, you know, through the, the GME and the, her DIO office, have really been working to enhance um, plugging patients, um, plugging residents into care um, and to provide um, uh, expedited care for um, trainees who might be experiencing distress. And so there have been channels that have been built within the, um, the, the you know, connection with our mental health resources. Um, I think, you know, oftentimes that when, when people are noticing that their um, colleagues are in distress, you know, one of the most important things is to try and um, see if you can reach out to that colleague directly and, you know, just inquire, you know, about how, how they are doing, but then also trying to um, connect them to care, whether it's through speaking to, you know, your own, um, you know, section chiefs and, and um, department leaders um, to see what those structural ways are um, to create that. And I think there is, you know, a case to be made for, you um, enhanced mental health services and support. Um, we do have the Perspectives Program, which is, um, I think, can be incredibly helpful, but oftentimes I think there may, needs to be a, a more tailored approach to, to dial it up when we are really concerned about a physician who is in jeopardy or distress. Well, thanks again, Dr. Lee, for this very important discussion on something that affects all of us every day. And um, 